Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yanis and I will present our results on uh, messaging layer security. This is a joint work with Joel, Sandra and uh, Yevgeny. First, I'll give some context by comparing secure messaging uh, with secure communication and highlight the differences. So in secure communication, we assume reliable channels between parties, so there is no message loss. Communication is synchronous and sessions are typically short-lived. Parties are online during sessions and resilience to compromise is a minor concern. On the other hand, on messaging, um, channels are unreliable, so messages may be lost. Uh, communication is asynchronous. Users might send messages and then go offline. Uh, sessions are long-lived. They might last for years. And this is why state compromise is very likely to happen uh, over the lifetime of a session. In the two-party setting uh, for messaging, we have the success story of the signal protocol, which is loosely based on the off-the-record protocol. It is used uh, by billions of people and uh, by many applications like Signal, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp and Skype. It won the Levin Prize at Real World Crypto. And its security is very, very well studied and very well understood. So uh, what about security of messaging for groups? So the naive approach would be basically to use a two-party protocol in a pairwise manner. However, this solution is highly inefficient. It requires complexity and square. So we need something much better than that. And this is the purpose of message layer security. So MLS started about two years ago, and currently we have its ninth version. The goal is to standardize a protocol for secure group messaging uh, with all login message complexity, where n is the number of users. There are many contributors in this project, both like from the academia, like many universities, and also uh, the industry. The functionality provided by MLS is like the following. Parties can basically join a group when they're invited by group members. They can leave group at any time. They perform updates to refresh key material, uh, and they can also send and receive messages. The attacker controls the network and the server. He sees all packets transmitted in the network. He can change packets, and he also controls message delivery. It can also uh, leak uh, the state of uh, group members. Uh, the MLS design considers several modular components, and there's lots of inspiration from uh, the two-party setting. Um, this is similar to the ACD19 paradigm. In ACD19, the authors saw how to modularize uh, the double ratchet using three primitives, namely continuous key agreement, uh, which is the public ratchet, uh, forward secret authenticated encryption, which is a symmetric ratchet, and also the glue between them, which is the PRF-PRNG. So ACD19 shows how to compose those three primitives and build two-party secure messaging. Now, the good news is that uh, the ACD19 paradigm also applies to MLS, of course, by considering the group variants of the corresponding primitives. So here we have a continuous group key agreement and end-party forward secure authenticated encryption, uh, and also signatures for uh, authentication. In our work, we focus on the uh, continuous group key agreement uh, primitive. Uh, in more detail, uh, the contributions of our work are the following. We provide a formal security model for CGKA. Um, we also prove and study security of the CGKA protocol that is proposed by MLS, which is called Trichem. And there are many surprises here. And we also propose uh, a modified version of Trichem that achieves better security. So now I will present a simplified version of uh, our CGKA security definition. Uh, our primitive supports the following functionalities. Group creation, first of all, so a user U can create a group G. Uh, a member U can add a non-member V to the group by executing add and similarly for remove. So a member U can remove another member B from the group. We also have the update operation, which basically refreshes the group state. And this is important for security, as we will see later. 
And then uh, we have the process operation, which enables processing of control messages generated by the above operations. The goal is to synchronously maintain a shared secret in a dynamically changing group. So protocol execution proceeds in epochs. Um, and with each operation, we have a new epoch and a new group secret. So for instance, consider our example. So here we have group creation by party A, and we're in epoch number one with group secret I1. Um, then B is added, and we move to epoch number two and uh, new group secret. And then B updates, C is added, C updates, and A is removed. So the group secrets are basically used by full messaging by the higher level protocol to uh, refresh uh, keys. Now the adversary controls the network and the server. He sees all packets transmitted in the network, but he cannot modify them. So this is one restriction. Another one is that uh, it controls message delivery, but it must deliver all messages in the same order to all users. So those two points are basically handled by the high level protocol. How? Basically using signatures. So the adversary would not be able to modify packets if messages are signed. And also uh, you can protect the order of messages by hashing the trust script. So besides that, the adversary fully controls the sequence of operations. He can ask users to update uh, their state, uh, to add other users or to remove users from the group. And also he can leak the state of group members. The privacy guarantees that we require is that group secrets should look random to the attacker unless they are trivially known. And since um, sessions are long lasting, we also require post-compromise security. So we should be able to recover from state compromise um, via normal protocol execution. And also we require forward secrecy, which basically uh, means that privacy should hold even against future state corruption, state compromise. Now consider an adversary that challenges epoch I. So the question is like, is epoch key also known as update secret of epoch I secure? Let's see the notion of optimal security. Optimal security, which implies PCS and FS, requires that all users that are corrupted at epoch J prior to I, or less than or equal to I, issue an update operation at some epoch T in the rate J plus one comma I. So basically this means if you have corrupted users before epoch I, those users just need to issue an update operation uh, before epoch I. We also allow corruptions after epoch I. And we also consider uh, two uh, weaker notions of security, forward security and isolation in which first corruption uh, can happen only after the challenge epoch, and also PCS in isolation, which is like optimal security, opt like optimal security, but no corruptions are allowed after the challenge epoch. Now I will present uh, the CGK protocol, which is proposed by MLS called Trichem. Trichem was uh, initially proposed in uh, the MLS mailing list in 2018, and it's based on an early work on asynchronous ratcheting trees. The packet size is O log N, and we also have subsequent work, which is causal Trichem, uh, tainted Trichem, and also actively secure CGKEA, which is a completely different protocol. For this talk, I will omit add and remove operations, and I will assume that no user is left behind, meaning that all users process instantly all messages, all control messages generated by operations. Our paper handles the general case. So we only focus on update and corrupt operations for study groups. And as we will see, this is still non trivial and captures the main difficulties. So the goal is to maintain a shared secret in a static group. Trichem uses a tree-based uh, structure. So members, group members are arranged at the leaves of the tree. So here we have eight members. Each node consists of a public key and secret key for public key encryption. 
And the invariant is that part is known only the secret keys on the path to the root. So this part here knows the secret key for this node, this node, this node, and this node. The root node is a special node, which I will uh, refer to it uh, in more detail later. So here we have eight parties, and the ith leaf corresponds to the ith party from the left to the right. Let's see how the update operation works on Trigen. Assume that party one, which is the first leaf, executes an update operation. The operation is basically using calls to a PRG, which is denoted by H. So what party one does is the following. It samples S0, a uniformly random seed S0, and computes the PRG over S0. This gives a new seed S1, which will be used in the higher layer, and also gives a secret key SK0. This is the secret key, the new secret key for this node. From this secret key, we can also derive PK0, which is the public key of the node. Then we go to the next level, and then using S1, we compute the PRG over S1, and we compute the seed for the next level, S2, and we also compute the secret key for this node. And using S2 here, we can compute the seed for the next level and the secret key for this node. Now, the thing is that S3 is basically the update secret. Um, is the secret or the group secret is the secret that is being computed that needs to be computed by uh, by all uh, group members. So this is how the update operation works uh, from the view of like party one, and this is how party one updates the uh, the tree. How do other group members compute I? How do other members compute the group secret? What party one does is that it encrypts the the seeds as I using uh, um, the public keys of what we call copath nodes. So basically, uh, S1 is encrypted under uh, the public key of node A. And since party two knows SKA, it can recover S1 and compute all the secrets to the root. Similarly, party one encrypts S2 under PKB. And since all those two parties, three and four, they know SKB because this key is in their path to the root. They can decrypt this ciphertext, recover S2 and compute S3 again. And the same for node C and those four parties. Those four parties here from um, four to eight, they know SKC and they can directly recover, decrypt the ciphertext and recover S3. For forward secrecy, we need to delete intermediate values. So the SI values that we computed earlier need, uh, need to be deleted. Um, and also, for forward secrecy, as soon as the group secret is being processed by the higher level protocol, it needs to be deleted from the state. Uh, however, we observe that the ciphertext that have been generated by the update operation have been uh, are known to the attacker because the attacker has access to the network traffic. So what we observe here is that if at some point in the future, the adversary via some uh, corruption uh, manages to learn SKA or SKB or SKC, then he's able to compute um, the update secret generated by party one. Now let's see an example that illustrates issues with Trigen's forward secrecy. From now on, we just write epoch numbers and we use the cross for blank nodes. So initially, all nodes in the tree besides the leaves are blank. We still have eight users and uh, the leaves store the public and secret key of each user, which like we refer to as init keys. This is a term used by MLS. So party one executes an update along the brown path and refreshes all keys along the brown path and also computes a new update secret. And we move to epoch one. Uh, party three executes another update operation. So we have fresh keys along the red path. Um, then party five executes an update along the green path and refreshes all those keys. And finally, party seven executes an update along the yellow path. Now, the question is whether uh, the update secret for Epoch 4 is secure. 
we introduce the notion of a bomb. So a bomb is a key that lets the adversary recover um, the, update, the update secret for Epoch 4. So observe that information about Epoch 4 update is encrypted under keys of nodes with a yellow bomb. So when Party 7 executes the update operation, it basically encrypts this secret under the secret key of this node. This is why we have a bomb here. Also, this secret is being encrypted under the secret key of this node. This is why we have another bomb here. And finally, the update secret is being encrypted under the secret of this node. So we have a third bomb. So each update operation generates log end bombs. Are those the only bombs that we have? The answer is no. And we can see why by checking previous update operations. When party number five issued the update operation, the secret for this node was encrypted under the secret key of this node. So here we have a green bomb. This green bomb basically says that the secret key of this node enables the recovery of the secret key and the update secret for Epoch 3. But the recovery of this secret basically enables the recovery of the secret for Epoch 4. Similarly, for previous update operations, like for the red path, for this update, when user number 3 executed the update operation, he encrypted this secret under this secret key. This basically implies that we have a red bomb here that allows the recovery of the red path. But if you recover the red path, you can recover this secret key and the recovery of this secret key enables the recovery of Epoch Secret 4 due to this bomb. Similarly, for, for this node, and of course, for the first update and the bomb that we have here. So for every, for every level I, we have two to the I minus one active bombs, which implies that half of the leaf keys are bombs. So by corrupting any user, still holding a bomb implies security breach for a POP4 secret. What if users update? So can the update operation help us you know, make things better? Assume um, party six issues an update operations operation al along the gray path. Then this update operation overrides all the keys in this path. So some bombs are diffused, making critical keys inside those bombs no longer accessible. Since we override this path, those secret keys are erased, so are no longer accessible. The thing is that at most one bomb is being diffused per level I with each update operation. We have n over 2 leaf bombs, and this implies that we need at least n over 2 updates to diffuse all bombs. So every update has n over 2 keys at leaves, which allow to recover new secret. Why is this a problem? Because forward security takes a long time to kick in, and each update overrides at most one leaf key, so we need n over two epochs to get forward security, even in the best case, even if nobody is corrupted yet. However, forward secrecy requires uh, security after a single update. So in the worst case, we will never achieve forward security if the right people don't perform, uh, don't perform an, an update operation. So Trickham achieves less than ideal forward security, even under the most favorable circumstances. In our paper, we characterize precisely the set of secure keys given the sequence of attackers' queries. We use the notion of uh, graph reachability on key graphs. Uh, and we basically saw that uh, the level of security achieved by Trickham is very far from optimal. The question is, can we do better? Can we do optimal? And the answer is yes, we can. By replacing standard public key encryption in Trickem with updatable public key encryption, we get an optimal secure uh, scheme for CGKEA. 
This notion of updatable PKE is closely related to key updatable PKE, which is used in the two-party setting for secure messaging by JMM uh, at Eurogroup 18. Um, our idea is inspired by proposal of Conrad uh, in the MLS mailing list. And basically the intuition is that this updatable PKE, uh, it gives you practical forward security. Let's compare updatable PKE with standard PKE. So in standard PKE, we have KeyGen, which generates public key and secret key. The encryption operation generates the ciphertext over the message in the public key, and decryption recovers the message. Um, for correctness, senders need not to be synchronized, and CPA security requires encryptions of any two messages to be indistinguishable. Now, for updatable public key encryption, the syntax has as follows. Keygen outputs uh, a new public key secret key pair, PK0, SK0, the, in the initial keys. And the encryption operation receives public key and message and outputs a ciphertext together with a new public key. So the encryption operation refreshes the public key, um, PKM, the, the, refreshes the public key. The decryption operation receives the secret key in ciphertext and produces the method, but also produces a new secret key, which basically this secret key needs to be synchronized with this public key here. For correctness, we require all senders to be synchronized, and this is guaranteed by the MLS assumption. And also, encryptions of any two messages are indistinguishable, like for CPA security, even given the secret key obtained after decrypting the challenge ciphertext. So the idea here is that even if the adversary is given CI, SKI, and PKI, he can not recover any information about SKI minus one. And basically this means that MI is still protected. So this, it gives you like forward security. Our updatable public key encryption uh, construction is based on El Gamal and the random oracle model and is similar to JM, JMM18. And now let's see how this uh, new protocol works, uh, RTRICM, which stands for uh, re-randomized TRICM. Assume party one executes an update operation. The update operation is very similar. You generate basically the seeds along the direct path and then you encrypt with respect to the circle nodes as we did before. However, the scheme that you use now is updatable public key encryption instead of standard public key encryption. So S1 here is encrypted under the public key of node A. The encryption operation generates CA, but also re-randomizes the public key and produces a new public key PKA prime. Also, the decryption operation over CA recovers S1, but also produces a re-randomized uh, key SKA prime. And the same happens for nodes B and C. Like encryption other PKB of S2 produces CB and a new public key, PKB prime, and also decryption of CB produces a new secret key. And now the idea is that if you have corruptions, if the states of the users are linked to the adversary, let's say for this node, then the adversary learns SK prime A, but by recovering SK prime A does not break security of, of the scheme, right? So SK A remains secure and S1 remains secure. And the same happens uh, if you have uh, states that are leaked for those nodes and also for those nodes. So here, if, if, you, if you have users, uh, compromised users here, then the adversary learns SK prime B, but is not recovering SK B or S2. So this is the main idea. In the paper, we have more results. Uh, we have security against ad adaptive adversaries, and we also propose future directions and open programs for secure group messaging. There are also other stuff like multiplicative UPKE uh, for elliptic curves, uh, you can check uh, the post by uh, Joel in the MLS mailing list uh, and also a draft on this topic. And basically, the, that's all I had to say. And uh, this is our ePrint version of the paper. Um, and 
थैंक यू